welcome back everybody to another episode of the clutch talk podcast slash youtube slash we do it all as always i am your host john very happy to be here my boy jay his over there in the six how you doing baby i'm doing great ready to talk about these sons we got a good guest uh so i'm excited for that let's go Oh, yes, sir. You know, we got a great, great, great guest, man. You know, uh, today we, we we had to bring on Dave King, man, they, the host of the Solar Panel at Phoenix Suns podcast, the head writer for the Bright Side Sun, a Phoenix Suns blog for SB Nation, man. Dave King, we are very, very happy uh, to have an exciting and knowledgeable guest like you. I don't know if you want to introduce yourself to the fans, say a little oh, bit you about guys. yourself. Yeah, you guys are too kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate coming on. I love talking about the Suns. Uh, you guys hit all the points I would have hit anyway. So uh, uh, thank you for that nice intro. Let's get going. Yes, let, let, let's get right into it. But uh, just 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 before we do get into it, I just want to let all the fans know because we've been getting a lot of requests. Uh, they want timestamps. So I just I want to I want to let all the fans know our recording time uh, today is a beautiful over here on the West Coast. Beautiful Monday morning, September 20th. Uh, wh- where are you at, Jay Hill? I know you in the six. What time is it over there? Bro, it's 11 uh, a.m. in the morning here. Okay. And Dave, you, you in the West Coast with me over here? I'm in Arizona, so we never move on our time. For, so for six months a year, I'm on your time zone, and I'm right in the middle of that. Okay. All right. That's perfect. That's perfect, man. So 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 now we, we, we got the time set, man, so we could <laughs> move, move, move forward. So Dave, um, the first question that we love to ask the fans here for these fans' interviews is, as a Suns fan, are you content with the way the year went? Oh yeah, we have to be, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's funny because the Suns have been out of the playoffs for 10 straight years, have never, haven't made the finals in 28 years. And yet, um, the Suns played so well all year and took that two Oh lead in the 2021 finals against the bucks. And there's actually a group of Suns fans, a lot of Suns fans, more than I would have expected that are bitter over how it ended because the Suns lost four straight when Giannis decided to go into God mode, became the best player in the, one of the best players in the history of the NBA during that series. After he had split his leg backwards two weeks prior, he suddenly, you know, he was better than ever. That may have given him superpowers or something. I don't really know, but um, I am thrilled with how the Suns season went. They were second best in the entire second best record in the entire league second best record in the West, uh, only one game behind Utah. They uh, blitzed through the playoffs and, uh, and beat every, every comer and got to the finals again for only the third time in franchise history and had that 2-0 lead in the finals. And then just the magic kind of wore out. You know, Cinderella, I think it, I think it hit midnight. Um, this was, the Suns were supposed to take their lumps in these playoffs as a young team. You're sure you got Chris Paul at 36 years old. He had never been to the finals, though. He'd only been to the conference finals once. And then you've got um, then you've got Devin Booker and Mikkel Bridges and DeAndre Ayton and Cam Johnson, all those guys who had never even been in the playoffs at all. They were supposed to take their lumps that first year and get knocked out in the first, second, or third round. But they made it all the way to the finals until the, the magic started, started wearing off. So um, I am thrilled with how the season went. Any reasonable person would say that uh, the Suns exceeded every expectation they had and then some and only lost when really Giannis just became unstoppable. Yeah. And so that, that, that leads me right to my, to, to my next question, which I, I, I believe you, you answer, you know, you just said any reasonable Suns fan would have believed that the Suns exceeded expectations. So I have mm-hmm. to ask Dave at the beginning of the year, did you expect a uh, second in the Western conference and NBA finals? <laughs> Cause I didn't. Well, I'll tell you what um, <clears throat> optimistic Suns fans would say uh, that we did expect. And I, I, I am on record for saying this. I thought the Suns would get a top four seed. I did not think the Suns would be fighting for the best seed in the conference. And, and it wasn't just like a fake number on wins. The Suns had the best record against the league's best teams. They had the best point differential against the league's best teams. They had the best road record in the league. They had the best clutch record in the league. I mean, the Suns were just so good all year. Did I expect that? No. I expected top four seed in the West. I expected them to have a home court advantage. I hoped for and thought that the Suns could earn themselves a home court advantage in in the first round and then see what happened after that because they hadn't been in the playoffs in a decade. So, um, and I felt I was being 
extremely optimistic. And there they are going all the way to the finals. Man, so, so you know, uh, Dave, I, I got to ask this question. I got to get this out the way. There's a big elephant in the room over there in, uh, in Arizona, and we got to talk about it. Okay, I, I'm sure you've heard these names a lot since the playoffs has got done. Anthony Davis, Jamal Murray, Kawhi Leonard. A, a lot of people in the NBA were saying that, oh, the Suns got there only because they, they faced an injured team every, way, every, single, uh, play, every yep. single series on the way. How would you feel and what would you say to a fan that would say that the Suns did get lucky? Uh, I, would, <laughs> I would say you have every right to feel like the Suns were fortunate uh, to not have to play the other teams at their very best. But I would also say that every single playoffs has its advantages. To Lakers fans lamenting LeBron James and Anthony Davis not being healthy in the first round, I would say, dude, your guy is 36 years old, LeBron James. He's not going to be. 100% again. If he is, it's going to be lightning in a bottle. Anthony Davis, his whole career, he's been, he's been injured on and off. And I tell you what, man, that guy had one magical uh, playoff run. And what was it? It was in the bubble with no fans in the stands. I mean, if you're going to give somebody an asterisk for their playoff run, you've got to give the Heat and the Lakers an asterisk a little bit because they, they did it uh, with no fans in the stands, no adversity. It was in a bubble. All they had to do was was play great, and, and the Lakers actually far exceeded shooting expectations in that playoffs a year ago. So that's what I'd say to Lakers fans is, you know what, you get what you get. And do we hear the Lakers fans talking about how lucky they got sometimes and, and not having to feed, you know, play face other teams' best players? No, because you know what? History doesn't remember who was out. History only remembers who won. And Lakers fans be the first ones to tell you that history only remembers who won. They don't talk about how. Um, then, uh, against Denver, you know what? Denver still had the league MVP clear cut, no holds barred, no question league MVP playing in for Denver. And they had just beaten Portland who had one of the top five players in the league themselves and Dame Lillard without Jamal Murray. And they had gone 13 and five to finish the year without Jamal Murray. So to say that Denver is, was a shell without Jamal Murray should be a, a, an insult to Nikola Jokic. Uh, and then in the third round against uh, missing Kawhi, obviously, it's so much easier to beat the Clippers without Kawhi, for sure, 100%. But you know what? The Clippers, without Kawhi, beat the Jazz, who were the number one team in the West, in the playoff round prior. And if the Clippers had beaten uh, the Jazz, excuse me, uh, while the Clippers beat the Jazz, no one's talking about Donovan Mitchell being injured and and uh, and uh, Mike Conley being injured during that round, they would have just celebrated the Clippers moving on, which they did. So everyone, look, everything ha play, things happen. There were more injuries than usual last year. The Suns got you know what? The Suns took advantage and they did the most they could with it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give them an asterisk. Now coming into this year, do I think it's going to be harder? It should be. It should be harder. Those guys should be healthy. It's not my fault if they're not healthy. It's not the Suns' fault if they're not. It's not just like it won't be anyone else's fault if Suns players get injured this year. You take advantage of the moment you have, and you run with it. And the Suns did that. So I'm, I'm not entertaining any asterisk talk. Every playoff run has asterisk. There was a great story. I forget. Oh, shoot. I forget where it was, but somebody was writing out every single championship has an, should have an asterisk next to it for one reason or another. And um, that's just the way it is. But nobody remembers those. They only remember who won. Exactly, man. And, and Jay Hill, what do, what do you always say? You know, what, what do you always say when it comes to injuries? When we talk about you got to play, what do you always say, Jay? Yeah, Dave, no, I'm right there with you. It's always you play who's in front of you. Uh, as a Warrior fan, I know this to be true. Uh, there is there during our championship run to our past three titles, there was all those asterisks about you know injuries. If if the Cavs were fully healthy. And, and the asterisk goes the same way when the Cavs, you know, Draymond was suspended for, I think, game five or six. Iguodala, who's one of the defenders for them, was was out, you know, most of that series. Um, so, you know, yeah, you're always going to face adversity um, to make it through the uh, uh, throughout throughout the playoffs. But it's survival of the fittest, like you said. So I think that nothing should be taken away through, through the Suns and, and their run this season. And not to mention, you know, Chris Paul's 36 and he was injured at the beginning of that season. Uh, sorry, of that series against yeah. the Lakers. 
and you know Cameron Payne, all those players stepped up. So you really can't take away anything from the Suns and and their run this this uh, this past playoffs. Yeah, thank you, and that is a good point. Let me uh, just go back. I didn't even talk about that. So you've got Chris Paul, who was playing literally with one arm. Dude couldn't even. I can. I could dribble than Chris Paul could in that first round. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> uh, he was losing the ball on the dribble. Like you see those clips of old uh, of guys just, you know, who hadn't picked up a basketball in their whole lives and they try to dribble and the ball just dribbles away from them. Mm-hmm. That was happening to Chris Paul because he got that stinger and it lasted most of the series. Second round, everybody was healthy. The Suns swept uh, the league MVP. In the third round, Devin Booker's uh, the Suns, as they were going up 2 0 on the Clippers, which could have been a sweep. At that point, you know, if you're if you're going to look at it from that direction, uh, Devin Booker's nose gets broken in three places. Have you ever played? Have you guys ever played basketball with a broken nose? No, but I but I do know that you lose sense of direction when your nose is broken. So that makes it very hard. It's right, totally, yeah. look, I haven't played basketball with a broken nose, but I've had a broken nose. And I swear to God, I can't imagine driving in there among the amongst the beasts in the NBA with a nose broken. Devin Booker joked about it two games later. He's like. You have no idea how many times your face gets hit in an NBA game until your nose is broken and you see nothing but but fuzz and blood every time in your mm-hmm. eyes. Every time, uh, Steve Nash, man, I, I got flashbacks when that happened. You know, Steve oh, Nash yeah. and that spirit Robert Ori series. But anyways, yeah. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, but you know, Dave, um, and, and, and those those points that, that that you made about AD, about Jamal Murray, and Kawhi Leonard, those are all uh, extremely valid and. Uh, that actually leads me right to my, to, to my next question I, I had to you, Davis. If, if you faced, you know, a Lakers, a, a Clippers or a Denver this year, I know you, you did mention that y- you know that it's going to be harder this year. So if you faced uh, in a seven game series, a Lakers, a Clippers or a Denver, do you, would you feel confident with the fully healthy Lakers, fully healthy uh, Denver and Clippers and the fully healthy Suns as well, though? Sure. You know, um, uh, this is probably going to sound a little bit like uh, uh, myopic because I, I will only watch, mostly watch the Suns and I watch some of the rest of the teams, just like every fan, right? So what I saw in that Lakers series round was when Anthony Davis uh, played really, really well for them in that series and LeBron James was as as, as good as he was going to get in that series. I, I, we all agree LeBron James was not full LeBron James in that series, but he was pretty darn good. Um when Anthony Davis was at the top of his game, the Suns had a hard time because he kept drawing fouls. Uh, but really, by uh, and really, there was only there was only uh, a, a half basically where the Suns had had time to figure out how not to foul Anthony Davis every single time he got the ball in that first half of the game four, and the Suns had the lead when Anthony Davis went down with that pulled groin. Um, I, what I would say as a homer is I would say the Suns would have figured that out. They had started figuring out really Anthony Davis got half of his points at the free throw line because he knew how to draw fouls. And of course it happened in the Suns again in the finals against Giannis, but um, it's, it's tough to fault a team when it's Giannis and Anthony Davis scoring on you. Would the Suns have been able to beat a fully healthy Lakers team? I, I think so because, and I wanted the Suns to face the Lakers before that series began when those guys were healthy. Uh, because the sun shooting their collective defense, all that was going to out, it was going to outlast the Lakers who just couldn't shoot. And this year again, look guys, I don't know how excited you guys are about the Lakers. A lot of people are putting the Lakers as a, as a shoe into the finals. I personally don't see it. I mean, there, are they going to install extra space for the walkers on the sideline? You know, for all those guys who are 35 plus Rajon Rondo even joked, he's a young guy on that team and dude is like 35. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't know how that team's going to make it all the way through. I'm as worried about golden state as I am about anybody else. Speaking of uh, being a golden state fan. Um, I am a little skeptical on how good clay Thompson's going to be coming off two extremely serious injuries to his right leg. Um, it's tough to come back from that. You end up with nagging injuries. If he's uh, super fortunate, he's Kevin Durant and he's, perfect by the time the playoffs come around. Uh, but there's, you know, there's, there's a, there's a greater than zero chance. He's, he's more of a Kyle Culver for a little while than, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, sorry, not to denigrate clay, but uh, his shooting is not going to go anywhere for sure. 
but what else can he do on the court for the first few months he's back? I'm not really sure. And then that, then that dictates playoff matchups and stuff. So, um, and then against a full Denver, uh, fully healthy Denver, the Suns had, uh, played Denver to overtime twice earlier in the season with Jamal Murray. And he only got, they only got, they only won one of those games because Murray was able to take four steps into a step back three uh, to tie it uh, at the end of one of those regulations. So look, every one of these playoff series would be down to who makes the clutch baskets at the right time. And so can the Suns beat anybody healthy? Absolutely. Can they lose to anybody healthy? Absolutely. <laughs> Just like every team. Definitely, man. Definitely. So, um, so Dave, I, I got a very big question to ask you very controversial question to ask you You know during uh during the season uh there was lots of talk about uh possibly chris paul for mvp you know and i and i think to myself who better to ask than uh, a knowledgeable suns fan like you you know you said you watch every you know every suns game mm. so as this year went and you know, as this year went uh went by did you have in your mind like okay i have chris paul as my mvp uh, I don't think anybody in Phoenix thought Chris Paul would be an MVP candidate until the second half of the year, uh, just simply because 36 years old, you've got all these other guys who are MVP candidates. Um, but by the end of the year, we had all kind of agreed. This, like, okay, let me just say it. The, the national talk about potential MVP and Chris Paul being in the running came first. And then Suns fans thinking maybe that's the right call came second. So nobody around Phoenix actually was touting Chris Paul for MVP before some of the national guys did. Um, so we kind of talked ourselves into it, but really Chris Paul has been in the top seven of MVP voting 10 times. He's been in the top seven of MVP voting. That doesn't mean obviously he's never been the league MVP, but he's always a guy that people recognize as the dude who is the engine that runs a team and makes them better than they were. And obviously carrying the Suns into, uh, you know, on, on this magical ride after them missing the playoffs 10 straight years, there was a little bit of a push and pull like uh, Suns loyalists. They really wanted, like, they didn't want Chris Paul taking away the great story of Devin Booker growing into his own MVP level kind of player. And if you just give Chris Paul all the credit for carrying, that means you're not giving the young guys any credit for having grown up and gotten good enough to make the playoffs without him. And so there was a little bit of homerism going on actually against Chris Paul as MVP candidate amongst Suns fans for a long time. So, uh, but then we all realized, you know what? It's okay. Everybody can eat at the table. There's not just one plate. So it's all right. And it's okay for Chris Paul to be an MVP candidate. And it's okay for Devin Booker to be a guy knocking on the door in future years. And, and uh, certainly, you know, uh, make an all-star again and knocking on the door of all NBA it's okay for all of that to be true. And that was tough for Suns fans to adjust to. Um, but definitely, did I think Chris Paul should be an MVP candidate? Yes, because of what he did to help focus the Suns on doing everything right, every play, and that eventually gets you to the wins. Um, he, uh, Monty Williams actually is the coach. He pushes um, the, the mantra that Greg Popovich made popular over in San Antonio, which is pounding the rock which is basically you can't split a rock on one swing, right? You just got to keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. And eventually it cracks. That's how the Spurs have always won. And they won four championships in 15 years. Um, and uh, Monty Williams is like that too. And Chris Paul is like that too. He's just like, you hit that rock in the same exact spot every single time. That's, that's Chris Paul. He's like uh, over, you know, over managing, but the young sons listened to every word. They soaked it all in and they loved it. So do I think he was worthy of MVP consideration for sure? Do I think he was the MVP of the league? No, probably not. But you know what? Ten times he's been voted by media as top seven in MVP voting. That doesn't mean he ever got really close to winning, but it means people recognize his value. Yeah, man. And, you know, for, for, for me personally, when, when, when that whole uh, MVP for uh, Chris Paul for MVP debate was going on, the biggest thing that I would say was, uh, the way I would look at it was, all right, well, well, what's an MVP? And a lot of people say an MVP is who brings the most value to their team. And if you if you look at it that, like that, then Chris Paul should definitely be the MVP because before Chris Paul was on the Phoenix Suns, they were in the bubble going 8-0 and and still missing the playoffs. And then now that Chris Paul is on the Suns, they're competing in the NBA Finals against 
Giannis, like how you said, going into God mode. So, mm-hmm. uh, so f- for me, I, I, I really want, if that was people's criteria for MVP, I really wanted to give it to Chris, but I had a hard time when other players like Jokic were just having the, 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 the season, oh, that, sure. the season that, that they were having, man. But, but, but what about you, Jay Hill? Like how, how did you feel throughout the season as, as Jay, as a uh, Chris Paul went on this uh, spectacular run and really was the anchor for the reason that the Suns made it to the, to the championship? No, oh, I think that when, when the Suns, you know, brought in, Chris Paul, the the whole the premise was bringing in a veteran leader. You know, he, he's obviously past his prime in terms of playing, but his IQ and his leadership will never le- uh, leave. And I think that's what we saw. Like Dave mentioned, those young guys just believed in what he was preaching. Um, and, and just the accountability and, and the leadership aspect of what he brings to a, to a team is, I think, more important than anything. And, and that's why he should be considered uh, as an MVP and can be considered 10 times. So that, that, that statistic right there is mind blowing that I thought it was two or three, uh, just that, that actually makes sense now because every single year he brings his team to the next level. And I think that's just a case of what we saw with the Suns. but just to answer your question, no, I don't think he should have been the MVP of the league, but he was definitely the MVP of the Suns. And I think that's that's a testament to him because Devin Booker could be seen as, you know, their best player, but their most valuable player is definitely Chris Paul. So uh, that that's just how I feel about that. But about about the league. No, I don't think he's the MVP uh, of the league this year. OK. All right. So so, you know, as we transition uh, away from that and, and more a little bit into uh, free agency, you know, I want to I want to talk to you a little bit about that, Dave. So we knew for, for the Suns heading into free agency that the number one priority was retaining players was, you know, re-signing Chris Paul, hopefully on a team friendly deal, uh, bringing campaign back and, um, and ho- hopefully bring Frank the tank back, man, you know, <laughs> and, and, and you guys, you guys were able to, you guys were able to do all three and you guys were all a- also able to sign JaVale McGee, Alfred Payton, and then traded, uh, traded for Landry Shamit. So which, which to you, Dave, of these uh, off season moves has got you uh, most has got you uh, more excited. You know, I know Chris Paul, of course, but, you know, past that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, I'm uh, let me just say that the the perfect summer was running it back with the same team to me. They already have the team that showed they could make the finals. So why would you make big changes? Right. So I, I thought that was a perfect summer. I also think this is the perfect summer to have done a run it back because it was boring as hell because all we're doing is re-signing the same guys. There was no excitement. I mean, the, the biggest acquisition the Suns made was Landry Shamit. I mean, come on, you know, that's, but then again, it's a finals team and everybody was young and everybody's under contract and everybody's ready to go. And all you had to do was have Chris Paul sign something that, that doesn't tie you to him when he's 40 years old, if you don't, if he's not good anymore and you need a campaign to come back because that dude is that, that dude is such a reclamation story. I just love campaign. He's just so fun. Um, <clears throat> so that was a, the ideal summer was bringing those guys back. What you worry about for the Suns coming into next year is something that um, I like what somebody called it once, the disease of me. It's the coming back, to, like last year, everybody owned their role. Devin Booker on purpose made himself more of a pure shooting guard than a combo guard because Chris Paul is such a rock pounder himself that Devin Booker became more of a shooter than and, and finisher than he was a playmaker. Um, he had six and a half assists a game the year before uh, and then only four a game this year because he was letting Chris Paul do all the work. Uh, and uh, De- DeAndre Ayton had... 30% less shots a game. I mean, the number one, former number one overall pick went through the entire year getting um, ripped up on social media because he wasn't, he wasn't playing as well as the year before when really all it was, is he was getting less touches because Chris Paul and Devin Booker were dominating um, and the Suns were winning and, and everybody subjugated themselves for the greater good. What I hope doesn't happen this year is now people going, but we can be even better if I get more touches. If I get more shots, if I get, you know, more control. So I'm a little worried about that. Um, um, so I wanted to go into that a little bit. What's, you know, what's, what was my biggest, my biggest move um, 
for the off season was simply to make sure that the team is still comes back happy and focused. And I think Chris Paul and Monty Williams will uh, be the drivers of that as, as you know, as, as the lead player and the coach, I thought that was a great free, uh, great summer. Um, it'd be nice if <clears throat> they got a little bit more size. Um, the sun somehow survived only having one big man over, you know, uh, who, who had mobility, who could play in their defense with DeAndre Ayton and everybody else was really a, a role player on the, on the front line. And then eventually De- Dario Sarge got hurt and he's out for most of this year, at least. Um, I wish the Suns would have done a little bit more than JaVale McGee to shore up that front line, but even JaVale McGee is an upgrade on that finals team coming in. And then Landry Shamit is an, a really nice off, off screen, off ball shooter um, that will help um, like when, when they're running pick and rolls and stuff like that. So I think they made some margin calls, you know, some, uh, some, some moves along the margin that'll help the team. But the biggest thing was bringing back that core and keeping them happy. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what extensions DeAndre Aiden and Mikel Bridges get. Uh, they're up for rookie extensions. And you don't want either of those guys to come into next season thinking they're playing for an extension because then you get that disease of me creeping in. Okay. So, so Dave, you, you talked about a little bit about the additions uh, this year for the Suns in the offseason. Let's talk about a little bit about the offseason subtraction. So obviously this past season, you lost Langston Galloway, Tory Craig, Etwan Moore, and Javon, Car- Javon Carter. So the name that sticks out to me, we saw, you know, Tory Craig before his injury. Yeah. Um, he, he was, he was a big, you know, off the bench presence for, for, as a defender, you know, he, he knocked down some big shots as well. And then we saw a little bit of each one more, not really much from T- Javon Carter, but out of those names that you lost this past off season, who, who is, uh, who, who is the biggest one for you and, and why? Yeah, I think the biggest loss has to be Tory Craig uh, because he had a really good role in the playoffs as he was actually in the finals, the Suns' be- second biggest player. Because <laughs> when Dario Sarge went down in game one, um, Tory Craig plays a little bit bigger than his 6'7", 220 size as far as just physicality a little bit. Uh, but that's, you know, the Suns need to improve on that area. But having Torrey Craig in that four-man rotation with Jay Crowder, Cam Johnson, and Mikkel Bridges in the in the swing forward spots around DeAndre Aiden was a really nice fit. The great thing about him, though, is he was acquired at the trade deadline for cash um, as a throw-in. So you got to hope or expect that James Jones can acquire that same level of player one way or another by the end of next year, just like he, like he did this past year. So Torrey Craig, as far as impact on a playoff team was the biggest loss, but what's great is that he, this is a guy who only averaged 15 minutes a game. And if that's your biggest loss off a finals team, I think that's pretty good. Okay. All right. So, so, so Dave, um, how, how, you know, we've talked about the additions. We, we, we've talked about the subtractions. But how do you feel uh, just uh, overall, you know, a, as, a, as a Suns fan, we look at the offseason. Do you feel you guys got better, worse, or do you guys stay, stay the same? I just think one more, another year together. Okay. Like I said, I'm, uh, the only thing I'm worried about is them all of a sudden players started getting starting to get a little selfish because they did all play perfect roles last year. And in many cases, their role – the role they played, at least on offense, was a little smaller than one they have capacity to play. Don Drayton could demand the ball more. Mikhail Bridges could say, look, I got to earn my extension, man. Give me the ball more. Cam Johnson actually started showing some really good skills in the in that playoffs. I mean, all these young guys, campaign might want the ball more. He's he's shown he can he can handle bigger minutes. That's the sign of a really good team. And if you can keep them all on the same page, then they can be even better because you can you can find out more wrinkles than than you did this past year on on maximizing all their talents, and they're mostly young, uh, with the exception of Chris Paul and Jay Crowder in that starting lineup. Seven of the top nine players or so are are in early in their careers still, so you've got a chance to grow and get better just because of that. Uh, and uh, so the Suns have a chance to be even better this year, but there's also a chance they're worse because if they if they get more selfish and and tune out the uh the coach and the and and chris paul a little bit so i'm a little i'm wondering 
how they're going to sound in training camp, which starts next week when they start doing interviews again, we haven't heard from them in two months since they lost in the finals. Um, as far as the players, I want to hear what the words they're using and how they're sounding and, and whether they're still as bought in as they were a year ago on team concept. Uh, but if that stays, if they stay on that team concept, then they can be even better because most of their lineup is still young. Okay. That makes sense. So, so as we're on that theme of, of the roster for next year, uh, thing, thing we always like to ask here is it's called the clutch talk timeout segment. So we ask who, who is your go-to player under, under, you know, under in the last, you know, clutch time. So like in the last few minutes of a game, if you drop a play, who, who is that for you? Cause that, the names to come to mind, obviously is CP or Devin Booker. So you got pretty good options there, but who is it for you? Yeah, actually the Suns, that was one of the reasons we, we were very optimistic about the Suns this past year. Uh, Chris Paul, in the last two or three years, I can't remember the exact statistic, but he's one of the best clutch players in the league. Um, he actually led the league the year with the Thunder, and he was in, I think, in the top five or top three this past year as far as scoring and assisting and, and net rating and all that in the clutch. The Suns went from one of the worst clutch teams in the league the year before to one of the best this past year uh, for several years, Devin Booker was the only guy who could do anything in the clutch. He's got a handful of game winners um, on his resume already. And he won a couple of games for him this past year again. Uh, so with clutch, pa with clutch, Paul, uh, Chris <laughs> Paul running the show uh, and Devin Booker making big shots, the Suns are one of the best clutch teams in the league. They just, they just are. And they were definitely the best last year. Absolutely. And then for, for, to be on that note for next upcoming season, what, what is your starting lineup looking like? And then kind of talk a little bit about your bench rotation and, and who you guys have as your, you know, six, seven, eighth man and, and, and talk a little bit about that. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, the starting lineup for going into this next year is probably the same that started in the finals, which will be uh, Chris Paul and Devin Booker in the backcourt. Mikel Bridges and Jay Crowder in the front on the, along the front line with DeAndre Ayton in the middle. Um, and then what could change on that is, uh, is that Cam Johnson, uh, who is growing into a small power forward type, he can definitely play swing forward. He's not a great rebounder, but you got DeAndre Ayton, who is one of the best rebounders in the league making up for it. But Cam, uh, Cameron Johnson might force his way into the lineup uh, ahead of Jay Crowder by the end of the year, but in the middle uh, and before that, he's one of the top players coming off the bench along with campaign. Uh, so you got campaign backing up Chris Paul and you've got uh, Cameron Johnson along the front line as the primary backup there. And then other guys who, who will fit in depending on the situation for sure. And what minutes they play, but JaVale McGee coming off the bench as Deandre Aiden's backup for 10, 15 minutes a game is a good, option and Landry Shamit coming uh, um, as a shooter off the bench. So that's, you know, that's nine deep right there. And then whoever earns those minutes beyond that is, is based on who's playing really well. All right, Dave. So there's a question that, uh, you know, when, when I, when I knew that we got, we got the Suns interview coming up, I was like, man, I got to ask my guy, Dave, this question. So Dave, as a Suns fan, I want you to just give me a quick yes or no. If Devin Booker is better than these players. Okay. Cause I always hear controversy up and down. <laughs> so I need to know as just an overall player, is Devin Booker a better player than Donovan Mitchell? Oh, of course he is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> now you're asking a Suns fan though. But okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Jason Tatum. <sighs> Man, that is a tough one. Um, I'm going to put him on the same level. Jason Tatum's ceiling is higher, but he, um, yeah, Jason Tam's ceiling is higher. Let's just leave it at that. But I think they're in the same level right now. Okay. Jamal and, Murray. And real quick, Dave, huh? just, just before you answer that, is it just in terms what what about uh Jason Tatum makes you him have a higher ceiling? Is it athleticism or just sure like what what is it for you that, Yeah, that you um if Jason okay, so the reason they're on the same level right now is because Devin Okay, so uh, gosh, let me let me say, Jason Tatum overall. Jason Tatum is has a higher ceiling because of his athleticism and his frame, and his ability to play great defense 
when he's focused and um, couple that with incredible shooting and scoring and finishing ability. Now the Jason Tatum that played last year, which may have been probably was COVID limited in one way or another. I, I heard that he had to take an inhaler before games uh, to clear his lungs enough to play. Uh, that's how much it lingered for him. So that probably contributed to it, but I really think he's slightly regressed the last couple of years in terms of his overall game, because he's gotten a lot more ISO heavy. Like he insists on taking 20 footers, whereas Devin Booker takes those on purpose in the offense. Um, and, uh, uh, but Jason Tatum, it looks like he's not taking them on purpose. That's just the shot he wants to take. Um, I think, uh, a Tatum has a higher ceiling. He couldn't, he can score 50 on any night and he could lock down the other guy on any night. Um, so that's why I think he's got a higher ceiling, but I think current level of play, I think uh, Devin Booker is higher right now. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and, and Dave, you know, uh, I gotta, I gotta be honest, you know, that our last episode, uh, me and Jay Hill, we, we, we got a little bit into a debate. We were getting to the debate. We were talking about scores, right? Because we we were um, we were doing the Wizards and and I had asked the question I said uh, is Zach Levine is he in the same realm as a scorer as Bradley Beal and and J- Jay Hill got on me he was like no what no way and we, <laughs> we, we we went back and forth for a little bit we threw some names out and we came we came across the name of Devin Booker so I want to ask you do you think Devin Booker is a better scorer than Bradley Beal and Zach Levine or one or the other. Um... I tell you what, I uh, you can count on Devin Booker more than you can count on Zach Levine in tough moments. I mean, I think, and and it could be just affinity by the coach, but um, Devin Booker got a lot more minutes in the Olympics than Zach Levine did on the same team. Now, Bradley Beal was injured. Would he have gotten minutes over both those guys? Probably. Bradley Beal's problem is that he's been playing on such a crappy team after having been on a pretty good team. And so he's been playing really... Uh, Sel- not selfishly, but yeah, basically, I guess I would say that like he hasn't really been uh, focused on team aspect as much this past year or two, and his defense has really taken a nosedive, whereas Devin Booker was actually uh, considered one of the better defenders on the Olympic team uh, that won gold medal because he's focused now. So uh, Devin, Devin Booker's level of focus gets him in a higher plane as far as both scoring and defending over, um, I would definitely say Zach Levine hands down. Uh, whereas Levine can have like those unconscious moments. Levine is playing like Devin Booker of three years ago. Whereas I don't really care about defense and I'll drop 50 plus on you anytime I feel like it, but I know my team sucks. So I'm going to play like that. Uh, whereas, uh, Bradley Beal has been a great player on a good team. And, uh, he's got, he's, I think, He's a slightly better scorer than Devin Booker. He definitely makes his threes better. I tell you what, if Devin Booker ever figures out how to translate his three-point shootout wins from All-Star Weekend into three-pointers in the game more, and he gets that three-point rate to 38% or higher, neither of those guys can touch him. Uh, but the fact that he he just – I don't think he's practiced – game rep three pointers uh in practice in years i think he just assumes he has them and he just keeps missing because he's only at 34 35 percent last couple of years uh, but long story short i think i would have probably and this is suns fans are going to hate me for this but you know what i'd probably have bradley beal slightly better score than devin booker but i think um that is a great you know uh matchup if those guys were going at it yeah, that, that would be uh, unlimited offense, man. That would be yeah. great. That would be unlimited <laughs> offense, man. All right. So um, 1 through 15, all players on a championship team are very important, right? But but there is always a hierarchy, right? And, and uh, you tell me you tell me yours, but I believe that the top three being, you know, Devin Booker, Chris Paul, and DeAndre Aiden, like those being the, the top three guys. But, you know, you can't di- – you, you can't um, – Discount Mikel Bridges. Mikel Bridges is very, very important to that team and a key reason to the to the team being able to play and operate the way it does for uh, everything that he brings to the table. But like how we just said, he's not, you know, the top the top three guys. So I got I got a question to ask you, Dave, is Mikel Bridges a untouchable because he's a key piece. But he could also be a key piece in a trade to get you a real key piece to have. So you guys have 
uh, a, a big four, you know, uh, yeah. to be able to compete with the with the Nets of the league. With the with, I know you don't believe in the Lakers, but I mean they got a lot of talent. I know that's one thing they do. They got a lot of talent over there. So like, be able to keep compete with with those uh, talent heavy teams. Would that something you'd be open to doing, or you'd rather keep Mikel? <clears throat> so as a homer, I'd probably say I'd, I'd rather. I think Mikel is one of the best fourth best players in the entire league. I don't know that too many teams out there have a better fourth best player, which is a guy who shoots 42 plus percent from three um, can drive, can he finishes. He's in the top 99th percentile, I believe in finishing at the rim when he's in transition, when he's getting the ball on the cut on the back cut and all that. And he plays one of the best. He's one of the best defenders in the league. He's probably going to make all defense for the rest of his career going forward. He got, he was finished like 11th on a two man team. Uh, in, in terms of voting for this past year. So uh, he's just going to keep getting better. Now, is there, a, uh, is there a way you get a better fourth player for the team uh, if when you're still keeping Aiden Bridges, I'm uh, sorry, Aiden Booker and Paul? Uh, that's the problem is who is it you're bringing back? I don't want to bring back another dude who is mostly scoring because the Suns already have enough scoring. Uh, do you bring back a guy like, for example, Aaron Gordon in Denver? Who's better, uh, Mikel Bridges or Aaron Gordon? Mikel I, I think Mikel Bridges, right? Yeah. And Aaron Gordon has been one of the top trade targets for the past three years on the on the trade market because of his potential at being an all world defense and um, uh, uh, still playing pretty good offense. Mikel Bridges is better than that. So who do you trade him for? You know, it's like, uh, or is there a chance where you get a superstar who should be a team's top two or one or two or three in, in, in place of a Mikel Bridges in a trade? It's a, it just depends on that superstar and who that is. Is it LeBron James? Yeah, of course I'll take LeBron James. Is he a top 10, 15 player in the league? Sure. Um, but if a guy's top 30 or below in the league, then I'd probably just stay with Mikel Bridges because his personality, his willingness to do everything the top three, to fill in for every little hole the top three have, um, is really tough to replace. And I wouldn't assume that a, a player with a bigger name uh, can easily replace him. So I, I would stay with him unless you're getting a top 15, 20 player. Okay. All right. I, <clears throat> I, I, yeah, I like that. What's that yeah, thing? no, I think I think it's just uh, Mikhail Br Mikhail Bridges is a perfect example of the product that you know Villanova produces they, these days, like yeah. the Kyle Lowry's, you know, the uh, Dante DiVincenzo's. There's just those you know those players with that championship DNA who just do what it do whatever it takes to win. So I, he's a perfect you know Villanova product. Those guys are hard to come out around in the league though. So. That's why. Yeah, got 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 to hold on to those, man. All right, man. So, uh, so you know, as we as we start transitioning and as we start to close here, Dave, the two questions that we like to ask here at the end of the interviews is, uh, Dave, as a Suns fan, uh, barring health, of course, you know, let's hope that we have a healthy season. Hopefully, a never another COVID season like that again. Uh, where <laughs> where do you see the Suns finishing? with a fully healthy roster and how far in the playoffs do you see them going? I mean, <clears throat> it's, I definitely think the Suns will be in the top three in record in the Western conference. Uh, Chris Paul does not have the ability to coast. He just does. It's not in his DNA. And as long as Chris Paul is healthy and like you say, what would a healthy roster do? He's going to fight for every single win. He's going to fight for wins in October. He's going to fight for wins in January. He's going to fight for wins all the way through the season. So the Suns are going to finish with a top three record, which will guarantee him home court at least a round or two. Um, if not the top record to guarantee him home court all the way through. Um, and can they make it all the way to the finals? Absolutely. Um, so why would I predict lower when the same team is coming back and they've got all the internal development from the young guys uh, coming into play this year? I think they'll look a little different as a team this next year in the playoffs. They'll, they'll have a little bit more reliance on Aiton and Booker than offensively than they did this past, although it's tough to say you're relying even more on Booker in the future. Booker has capacity uh, to be more relied on um, as far as a playmaker. And then 
that he, that wasn't tapped this past year. And then DeAndre Ayton obviously is growing into his own as a finisher and scorer. So the will the team look a little different? And then Mikel Bridges could grow into an 18-point scorer too. Uh, will they look a little different next year in the playoffs? Yes, uh, probably. Where Chris Paul won't be quite as good as he was this past year. And for that reason, what if Chris Paul is as good as last year and those guys get better? They can get all the way to the finals. And no matter how tough the conference is. Okay. All right. So, so in the regular season, a, a top three, and then in the playoffs uh, finals, I, 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 I like that's prediction, but J, J Hill, let me, let me, let me get your taste. How are you feeling uh, as far as this, the Suns can make it? Yeah, I think the top three seed top two seed would be in my, my prediction for them next year. If you look at the West, in terms of roster makeup, there are only two teams that really don't have question marks and are kind of returning the same core, and that's the Utah Jazz and the Phoenix Suns. Uh, the rest, you know, the Lakers are bringing Russell Westbrook. We don't know what that looks, what that's going to look like. The Nuggets, you know, are going to be playing without Jamal Murray for the whole season or most of it. Obviously, the Clippers lost Kawhi. Uh, like Dave talked about earlier, Clay Thompson's coming back for the Warriors, but we don't know when he'll come back, what he'll look like. So in terms of, you know, the two teams that we know for certain are bringing back their teams is the Jazz and uh, the Suns, who finished at the top of the West last season. So I'm expecting more of the same this upcoming season from them. Okay. All right. And last question that we'd like to ask here, Dave, is if you could give us one word or one phrase to describe about how you felt as a Suns fan this past season, and then one word or one phrase to describe about how you're feeling being a Suns fan going into this 2021-2022 season. Wow. Okay. One word or phrase to describe last season, I would say uh, euphorically shocked. (laughs) <laughs> on how good they were. They were every day was a blessing. After 10 years of following this team through the muck, uh, that last year was a blessing. So I'll say that. Uh, this coming year, what word or phrase is just uh, to, to borrow from the Spurs, who've always been a rival of the Suns. And it's so fun to see that the Spurs are in rebuild mode and now they're the ones fighting for the top pick. And I, I love that. But to borrow a phrase from Coach Pop, who I have tons of respect for, pound the rock just keep grinding you're not gonna t- t- other teams are not gonna hand you wins just because you made the finals last year you're actually gonna be the target every single night and they're gonna you're gonna get their best every single night even the good teams even the great teams are gonna give you their best every single night when you play because they're gonna see that as a pre-playoff chance or their playoffs for the season or whoever depending on the team so you just got to keep pounding the rock and be resilient and push your way through and just play your game and don't cut, get caught up in I'm good. So we should get this game. You know, don't be a fan on the court, right? Fans always assume paper wins games. Paper doesn't win games. Basketballs win, wins games and uh, prove it on the court. So I would just say that is, is just fight through it. Okay. All right. I, I, I like your, I like your two words here. And, uh, and Dave, uh, we have a closing segment here. We'd like to do on clutch talk called guess the player. This is how guess the player works. Dave, I have three players here listed. Uh, both you and Jay Hill have two guesses. Um, I have thing I, I have here, uh, accolades, things that they did teams that they played for, uh, and just guesses and you and Jay Hill have two guesses. Uh, you can blurt them out whenever, whenever you get them, the guess, the hints will get easier as they go on. You got, you got the rules. I got it. And I, yeah. Current and, is current and. Yeah, um, current and, ret- players. and retired Could players. Could be from anywhere, huh? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right, here we go. The first player, this guy, he played for three teams. He is a one-time rebounding leader, a one-time NBA MVP, a 11-time All-Star, a one-time All-Star game MVP, a five-time All-NBA first-team member. His jersey is retired by the NBA team and college. He went to Auburn. Charles Charles Barkley. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, (laughs) Yes, sir. (laughs) Had to throw in the Phoenix Suns (laughs) legend in there. (laughs) Damn. (laughs) Charles Uh, Barkley. I don't know how I – I wasn't going all that far back. Yep, you guys said all time. All right, here we go. Here we go. All right. This next player, 
He uh, is a four-time All NBA Defensive First Team member. He is a one-time NBA player. I mean, and one-time NBA champion as a player, and a one-time NBA champion as a coach. He is a one-time U.S. Male Athlete of the Year. He is a ten-time All Star, a five-time NBA Assist Leader, a one-time Co Rookie of the Year. Jason Kidd. Jesus. Yes, sir. Oh man, yes, I was getting <laughs> close. <laughs> ah! You but said we in five Phoenix times. Don't say leader. Jason Kidd's name out loud as, as, <laughs> as so anymore. So maybe that's why I Jeez. just shoved him out of my head. Good job, man. <laughs> nice All right, here thing. we go. All right, last player. Last player we got. All right, this guy is a 11 time All Star. This guy is a one time Rookie of the Year, a one time NCAA champion, a one time National Player of the Year, a Knicks legend. He has his jersey retired by his NBA team and his college team. He oh, now Jesus. he now coaches Patrick the, Ewing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh man. <laughs> yes, sir. There you go, Jay Hill. Jay Hill is on fire today. I like that. You are man. on fire. You know what? I'm I'm feeling like I just can't put the parts together today. Good job, uh, man. Uh, thanks, man. <laughs> guess I the don't player. Know the names, yeah. Guess the player is a hard game, Dave. Yeah, this player is mm-hmm. a hard game, man. But. <laughs> <laughs> all right wow man. good job <laughs> jason <laughs> kid yeah see jason kid ever since because he played for the suns as you guys mm-hmm. know and uh that's probably why you used him as a player choice um that dude he just uh, we all have bad taste in our mouths from from when he left and what caused him to leave phoenix and so maybe i just put him out of my mind <laughs> <laughs> yeah jason- just, if you just said and on barkley if one of your clues had been and he says the nacho cheese is cold. I would have picked Charles Barkley first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys man. know what I'm talking about on that? Yeah. yeah. Wh- wh- oh, which man. Are- that one night he went on a rant on NBA on TV about how <laughs> bad it is in Phoenix these days. The dude is still a diehard fan, by the way. He mm-hmm. just likes to rip on the Suns. Mm-hmm. Charles Barkley, Charles Barkley is hilarious, man. But also, you know, to touch on that Jay Kidd uh, thing you're talking about, I think, yeah, Jay Kidd's time in Phoenix, it was a time everyone tries to flesh out their brain. Like he had the, he had the blonde hair. He had, he had the oh, whole God, thing going the on. Hair. <laughs> yeah, backcourt 2000 with Penny Hardaway. And yet uh, Penny never could get his knee right. That would have been an incredible team, Ooh, by the way, but man. never could get his name right or his knee right. And then, oh, yeah. Just the the yeah, uh, it's a it's a bad man. I in fact, because I don't want the Mavericks to do well, just as a as a rival, you know, mm-hmm. I'm happy they hired Jason Kidd because I yeah, he's going to single handedly <laughs> destroy that franchise. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you're you're hilarious, Dave. But this <laughs> this is a good place for us to go ahead and start and uh, wrap it up here, Dave. We we really want to. Really want to appreciate you, Ed, Dave, for uh, coming on here and uh, blessing us with your time. A uh, very knowledgeable uh, Suns fan, not just a Suns fan, also knowledgeable, uh, just overall NBA fan. Um, do you have any last words to say before we check off here, Dave? No, I want to say I appreciate you guys. I, I know this is the dog days of the off season and and previewing teams. We don't know how they're going to look. It's 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 tough. I know what it's like. So I appreciate you guys reaching out and having me on the show. It's been fun talking about the Suns. Yes, sir, Absolutely. man. So, J-, J. Hill, you got any last words you want to say before we check off here? No, nah, you got you said it best. No, nah, Dave, appreciate you coming on and excited. It's going to be a crazy Wild West this year. So looking forward to this season. Finally back to a regular schedule. Right, right. Yeah. Less than a month away. So, yeah. man, I wait. I can't wait. I'm extremely, extremely excited to watch that Wild West, man. But uh, for all the fans, if you guys are watching on YouTube, uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to go ahead and put Dave's uh, Twitter right there, right in his little bubble. I'm also going to put uh, I'm also going to put his podcast. You know, he is uh, the host of the Solar Panel uh, Phoenix Suns podcast. So I'm going to put that right there, right in his little bubble. So make sure you guys you guys go show him some love, man. Go check out some of those podcasts. I was just listening to the one you did with, with Zach Harper from the Athletic. Great podcast, by the way. Uh, oh, thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, great, great pod. Yeah, so ma- make sure you guys go, 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 check that out. And for all the fans uh, listening on Apple Podcasts and all that, make sure you guys go check, go check us out on our Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. It's at Clutch Talk One. I'll put it right here in our bubble, man. But, um, but yeah, you guys. So thank you everyone for tuning in, Dave. Once again, man, we really want to thank you very, very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys. I had a great time. All right, so that's it. We out of y'all. Clutch Talk out. Peace.